Podcasting from Beijing, this ain't no ordinary show. This is the Chris Reining Radio Show, covering the Middle Kingdom and beyond. This is your host, investor, author, and China expert, Chris Reining. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Chris Reining Radio Show. I'm your host, Chris Reining, and today I have with me Ulla Andrea Schenerud from DNB Norway. Welcome to the show, Ulla. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. For those that follow Scandinavian and, in particular, Norwegian economics, they may know you well from. The media and from your newsletters in Norway, but I thought we'd start with introducing you and DNB, of course. Yeah, you graduated from University of Bergen, I think, back in two thousand and eight. Is that right? Yeah, it's a few years ago now. Oh, not that long ago. <laughs> not that long ago. But you moved on from Bergen to City University in Hong Kong.、Mm. What we call here in China, we call it China Light.、Yeah. <laughs> what、uh, What brought you to to Hong Kong? Many reasons. It's Back in the old days, when I was very, very young, then I loved James Bond, and I always saw these these deep roads in in Hong Kong Island, and it triggered me. I want to go there. I saw the commercial signs from the streets,、uh, lots of people, Asians, and I think that Hong Kong is the best introduction you can get to to Asia and China in general. It's the pearl of Asia, we say here. You get the best of everything. You have the Chinese culture. But also we have the Western way of thinking. You have English so much,、yeah. so it's it's easy to adapt and it's very easy to fall in love、yeah. with the city.、Yeah. And I actually did too. Now I'm married to、yeah. to one from Hong Kong. Okay. So we've been married for. Well, and you met you met in Hong Kong. Yeah, we studied together in Hong Kong. Okay.、Uh, took politics there. Okay. We learned about democracy and how that's not developing so well. And now we have been dating for. Almost six years. Okay, great. So you brought love with you from Hong Kong back to Oslo. Yeah. At the end, I managed to talk her into moving to Norway, which is a bit of an experience for her. I live outside Oslo in a tiny town called Drammen, and sixty thousand people. And you can imagine the, this cultural shock from living in Hong Kong your entire life with seven and a half million people, and then you move to Drammen, sixty thousand、yeah. people, yeah. one yeah. shopping mall, which is decent. And this was back in two thousand and nine. You moved back roughly, or yeah, I moved back to to Norway in two thousand and nine, and then I went back to Hong Kong again、oh, okay. in twenty eleven、uh, okay. to write my masters、oh, uh, to、okay. finish my degree again.、Okay. And I, maybe I got this wrong, but did you lecture at the University of Oslo as I've well? I've been lecturing at the University of Bergen and then at the University of Oslo in macroeconomics and international trade. Okay,、uh, started very very young with、yeah. lecturing. Yeah, and and you joined DNB in two thousand eleven. You've been there about three years. Two thousand eleven, right、yeah. after I finished、uh, my my thesis,、uh, mm -hmm. I joined. I asked Chris Andorum for a job, and he said, "Yeah, we need a China <laughs> economist." Yeah,、uh, because was... be, because that's right. When we hear from Rune Bjerke, the CEO of DNB, or from Einstein, and they talk about Asia and, and China, it's Ulla's views we、yeah. we can hear. Yeah. They they're just copying whatever I'm saying, <laughs> telling them. So I have quite some power over what they're saying. Well, we should probably introduce the DNB a little bit as well. It's of course Norway's largest financial institution. It's a broad bank from retail to commercial banking, investment banking, the largest securities brokerage operation in in Norway. Some hundred and eighty eight billion kroner in market cap, and. With operations all over the world, you have an office here in Shanghai. You're on a Shanghai、yeah. trip now. We have we have an office in Shanghai. We have about, I think it's around thirty five employees there. But we have、mm. a big back office、mm. uh, department based in Singapore. So、mm. so the actual size of of our department in China is larger than what it appears. Yeah. We also have an office in Hong Kong in,、mm. in asset management. So.、Mm. We are spread a, a bit around, mm, mm, apart、mm, from being、mm. in Singapore, of course. It's, a, it's an amazing bank, and of course, we meet the bank in in sort of every fabric of the economy、yeah. here. You're here now on a China tour, speaking、mm. on the Chinese property market and how that might impact the global economy and and stock markets all over the world. What's sort of your take on the global economy right now and and China's role in it? If we can sort of start with the bigger well, the bigger picture. Well, I see global growth as as fragile. Most of all, the the overall level is good; it's decent. We're growing around three percent,、mm. uh, but you see a multi-speed recovery. It's a fragmented recovery.、Mm. You have U.S. doing fairly well,、mm. but the eurozone is having very anemic growth.、Mm. 
uh, even in Germany, which used to be the engine of, of Europe, is now having negative GDP growth. Mm. So we're seeing so much vulnerability in Eurozone in particular. Mm. Uh, and what I'm worried is, is how the Eurozone might uh, handle or not handle another negative impact mm. from, from what's going on in China. We have lots of structural changes mm. in the Chinese economy, mm. which of course will affect the rest of the world. Mm. But I'm a bit unsure whether the rest of the world is prepared mm. for these structural changes. Mm. One of the structural changes that's going on is, is obviously the shift from more of a manufacturing export driven economy towards a more service driven domestic economy. And we've seen the service sector now overtaking the manufacturing sector as a, as a component of GDP. Are we sort of overly focused on manufacturing, even though, given that there is a structural reform or disposition well, in the country, you think? Manufacturing or? matters a lot for us in the trade channel. Mm. I think China in general is mostly relative to, mm. to us, it's, it's important to us mostly through the trade channel. And, mm. and you also see that manufacturing sector is very investment intensive mm. and investments rely a lot on mm. imports. Mm. So, so even though you have a greater proportion of growth coming from the service sector today mm. than the manufacturing sector, the impact on other economies might be different, mm. even though mm. overall growth in China yeah. uh, is still quite good. Mm. So. What I usually tell when I meet investors uh, talking about China, yes, growth is still good, but it's the composition that matters. Mm. That's what we really need to look mm. at. Mm. Where is the growth coming from and how will that mm. cause spillovers to mm. other sectors mm. all over the world? And, and one thing you've been concerned about in that context is, is a slowing property market and how, what that means for the commodity sector. Yeah. One interesting point there is that you seem to be more concerned with demand, mm. namely the new build and, and new construction in China, whereas some other economists are, are maybe saying the commodity market is in a, in a down cycle or in a slump, not because of lack of demand, but because of oversupply. How much of, of the current down cycle you think is driven by oversupply or excess capacity versus slowing demand? I think if you look at commodity prices over the past few few months, if you look, mm. for example, at the oil price, mm. much of the weakness since June is related to this negative news that we once again have from China. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think that there is a potential here that the market starts focusing more on demand for commodities, mm. demand for iron ore. When I discuss this with other analysts, shipping analysts, commodity analysts, they seem to pencil in that Chinese import growth will continue at the same pace as it has been doing over the past few years. Mm. But I don't think that will happen because of the slowdown that I expect in the real estate market. Mm. But you also talk about, I mean, this is, you know, sort of back and forth a little yeah. bit. You yeah. also talk about what can be, what can modify or stimulate demand. And one thing that has been driving demand here is the continued urbanization process. Yeah. And you yourself in, in your research and articles have been writing about the plan to urbanize another 100 million people in the next uh, six years. Do you think you know, that that's a France and a, and a Germany almost in, in terms of <laughs> new builds? It's huge, right? It's immense. Yeah. Uh, this flow of people that will move or will move to cities or cities will move to them. It's going to be a lot of demand, of course, and this will ensure that demand will not collapse. Mm. We're still going to have a very vital sector, mm. important to the global economy, but when I see the flows here, the flows of people moving to cities mm. in the next five years will be mm. a bit smaller than it has been over the mm. past 10 years, mm. meaning that the demand driver will be less intensive going mm. forward. Mm. Mm. And uh, yeah. 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 So it's a slowing of growth. It's not as much a slow in terms of absolute demand. That's right. That's yeah. how I see it. Yeah. And considering that you already have always a bit oversupply, I think that supply has been growing a bit too fast over the past few years mm. since 2010 2011 mm. we see this very very rapid mm. acceleration of, of supply mm. of construction mm. some of the data may be a bit flawed mm. but i think even after we correct for these flaws mm. uh, we would come to a conclusion of 
of all the supply building mm. up. Uh, we see vacancies are mm. quite high now. Yeah, so, so let's talk a little bit about the numbers. I read some reports today saying that the estimated vacancy or overcapacity mm. in, the, in the residential property market is sort of pegged around 20%. Mm. And the US market is about is, you know, half, half of that, about 10%. It was uh, that. It, yeah. 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 I think yeah. probably at the end of last year. Has that changed a lot? I or don't, I don't no? Know. Okay. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just uh, thinking how this spills over into consumption because obviously in a market where property prices don't increase and potentially are flat or fall, mm. consumers will stop spending or waiting, certainly on the fence in terms of new investment. You don't get the wealth effect yeah. uh, anymore. But at least in the data, we see very little correlation or spillover from involvency in the housing wealth mm. uh, and, and actual consumption. I think that actual consumption is much more based on, on this wage growth and income growth that the mm. households are getting, mm. which is mm. still very solid. Yeah, very strong, right? Very but from a, from a relatively small base, of course, you know, yeah, compared yeah, to Europe, at yeah, least. They still yeah. have a lot of, of catch up there. Yeah, yeah. There's one thing, you know, that there is less new build and probably less demand. Mm. The, the other question is sort of where does that come from? How much of that is government induced? I mean, it's a slowdown in credit. People are not allowed to buy a second, third, yeah. fourth property, yeah. can't get bank loans. So is it, it's not necessarily a change in user behavior. It's a government induced slowdown in, in, in investment. Uh, many of those restrictions that they they implemented in 2010 are still mm. in place very much. Mm. They have reduced some of them this mm. year as sales have been dropping and prices have been starting to, to weaken. Mm. They have started to lighten a bit on, on these restrictions. Mm. But overall, they are mm. still very, very restricted mm. on, on, mm. on housing demand. So yeah. you might have an upside there yeah. uh, if, they, if things slow down too much. They mm. can do things to stimulate mm. the market mm. again. I guess no one, uh, including the Chinese and Chinese politicians themselves, would benefit from a falling property market. Many of them or most of them being property owners. Mm -hmm. So, you know, apart from a political sort of the political will to, to stimulate and keep the property prices up, what do you think the consequence of a falling property market in terms of price will be in terms of fallout? Because in, in one argument you have about China is that it's mainly equity or savings financed, uh, certainly for the households, as opposed to, for example, the U.S. economy, where a lot of the both the consumption and also the the residential property market has been driven by credit or uh, or bank loans. You see, you think this is an important factor? It's too? a very important factor, and it's mitigating the risks here. Mm. Uh, you won't have the same spillover effects as mm. you did in the U.S. Mm. But there are other risks if prices start declining. Local government revenues. Mm are very much dependent on, mm. on land sales, which again relates to property prices. Mm. So you can imagine a scenario where prices drop a lot mm. and then developers slow down their projects, mm. uh, request or reduce their demand for land areas, mm. which means that local governments might be squeezed on the revenue side. Yeah, yeah. That's one risk. Yeah, that's a that's a clear risk, and I guess that's also why you've been writing a little bit about uh, the dis or redistribution of the tax reforms. Yeah allowing local governments to collect taxes and raise public finance, yeah. both through the tax revenue base, but also through some of the new reforms we've seen actually out here in Beijing today on from the state council, allowing local governments to access the bond markets. You think that's, that's sort of a a credible source of revenue for local governments? It's, it's extremely important to, mm. to have a good funding or a stable mm. funding source for local governments. Mm. Tax is very important. Mm. Uh, you have to have some sort of balance in, in, in budgets. Mm. You cannot rely on selling assets, which mm. they're doing at the moment. Mm. Uh, bond market is a very, very important funding source mm. because it, it can replace some of the, the, the current more speculative mm. uh, funding, which is going through just companies, etc. Yeah. yeah. And that touches upon sort of the shadow banking yeah. or the local government finance vehicle yeah. markets that we've been all looking at the last sort of year or so. What's your, what's your view of sort of the financial sector and the stability and the, the risk there? It's extremely difficult to assess. Mm. Uh, it's very shady. It's very difficult to, to get good data. Mm. How Over do you get data? I mean, <laughs> sitting in Oslo and traveling yes. to China, how well, do you... 
Well, we so use, how do you access data? Well, we use the data from, from MBS, mm. uh, from People's Bank. We peg that to newspaper mm. articles, what we see, anecdotals, mm. uh, other reports from consultancies we use mm. a lot. Yeah. IMF is a very vital source for us. Yeah. I think that they give, they should give at least mm. a good picture of, mm. of the structure of the economy. Mm. And then it's our job to use the data that mm. we have available mm. to track the trends and mm. to see if we have any change in trends. Mm. And that's what mm. matters most for us. Yeah. But one thing that we really try to track and try to understand is sort of the credit and the liability side of yeah. the China Inc. balance sheet, so to speak, be it either the the shadow banking sector or the banking sector. We don't talk as much about the asset side on the on the balance sheet. And there's an argument that, you know, the asset side of the balance sheet in, in China is so much larger yeah. than the liability side that, you know, one, you have political will to deal with the liabilities, but you also have the assets. You have the, the capacity, Absolutely. the financial capacity to deal with the fallout. And, and if you look at the current account balance, it's, mm. it's a, it gives a good indication of, of the flexibility that the government has. Mm. They've been running a current account surplus for as long as we have data, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In huge surpluses. Well, the trade balance, so the trade yeah. surplus is uh, at least $300 billion, if not $500 billion this year. And that's almost an annual rate. Yeah, uh, We're talking about a country that has near 4 trillion US dollars in currency reserves. Mm. We're talking about a closed capital account. Mm. They uh, have some, some tools that they can employ uh, because of this. Yeah. How structure. insulated is the economy in that sense because of the closed capital account and the, the non-convertibility of the renminbi? Well, at, at least we see that uh, the exposure to to these more speculative mm. flows that we have in many emerging markets, they are mm. almost non-existent in China. They're mm. not really exposed to short-term mm. foreign exchange debt, mm. like, for example, Korea was in the mid-90s, Malaysia was in the mid-90s, like India has been up, to, up until recently that caused so much volatility for the Indian economy. We don't have these flows, yeah. which is reducing a lot of risk for the Chinese economy. Mm. I think it's a, one of the keys to understanding why China hasn't really had a crisis mm. in all of these years. And mm. Instead, have been one of the most successful mm. growth stories that we can think of in, in Euro history. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, uh, I think, on the horizon anytime soon to open up for full convertibility of the currency either, although there are experiments with dim sum bonds and other mechanisms. But we shouldn't expect too much there too no, soon. I don't think so either. No. And the capital markets, I mean, the stock markets, it's been a terrible investment, <laughs> especially the, the, the A-share market yeah. has been non-performing. Having said that, since April, it's, it's been performing quite well, actually, up about 12%, I think, in the last sort of four months. Do you have any feeling on how that, that is going to develop now that we see the exchange link between Hong Kong and Shanghai and eventually Shenzhen? Well, I'm still very unsure about the companies that are listed in, 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 in China. I wouldn't recommend anyone mm. to, to really have very optimistic views mm. on the stock market but do, in do you, China. Do you follow the overseas listed Chinese companies then? Not or? so much. Mm. Mostly track the macro, macro indicators. Mm. Uh, but then again, this, the financial market in China mm. is very, very underdeveloped. Mm. Both mm. the bond market, mm. but also the equity market. Okay. Uh, yeah. So... Not to put you too much on the spot, but do you have sort of an, an outlook or a forecast for, for 2014 yeah. that you can share with us? So I, I think that ideas. the government will succeed in reaching this 7.5% target. Mm. But then again, as I said before, I don't think that's what really matters. It's mm. the composition that matters for investors today. Yeah, and, the, and maybe uh, for the politicians here, more than the 7.5% number, maybe it's an absolute number of new jobs created. Yeah. We saw last year, you know, at, uh, at sort of uh, between 7 and 7.5% 7 .5 GDP growth, comfortably, China created at least 12, 13 million new jobs, yeah. which means that it absorbs you know, all of its new graduates. And isn't that what the politicians exactly. here are really tracking? They're not really risking the same sort of social instability mm. now as before, because the labor market is so much more solid. Mm. Mm. Uh, we see that the se service sector is growing faster. The service sector demands more labor than the industry sector. And if this continues, if this strengthens, mm. 
yeah. uh, then I think that the government can tolerate even lower GDP growth yeah. in the coming years without really risking more social unrest or higher unemployment. Mm -hmm. And what, what also plays, in, I guess, into the political toolbox is there is no inflation on the horizon. I mean, in this market of overcapacity mm -hmm. and sort of record output in the agriculture food sector, inflationary pressures is, is nowhere to be existence. seen. So I, I would think in that environment, monetary and fiscal policies can be deployed to, to address further slowdown? Yeah, they, they can use it. You can alter monetary policy like they have been doing this year. Mm. You've seen some small changes in reserve requirements mm. for smaller banks mm. so that they can lend out more money to the smaller companies. But then mm. they have been more reluctant in changing reserve requirements for the bigger banks because mm. they also want to reduce overcapacity mm. in the mm. bigger companies. Mm. So they have this flexibility. Yeah. They're using it to ensure that growth mm. doesn't fall too much. Mm. And I think that one reason lower inflation allows them to do this. Yeah. If there's one thing that Chinese people don't like, it's high, uh, high inflation, high food mm. price inflation. Mm. They want salary inflation, but not yeah. <laughs> cheap food and more salaries. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so I guess that's the the backstopper here. That for for most Chinese households, income is up. Yeah, property is. They have not, jobs. They have they jobs. Have higher wages. They're they're having a good time. I would yeah. say. Yeah, every year is a little bit better than yeah. than last year. Mm. Maybe with the exception of some of the traffic jams and, <laughs> and the, pollution. the pollution. But but they're working on that too. Yeah, food quality pollution. There are some some issues here, of course. And 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 they're they're well covered, of course, not only uh, internationally but also in, in China. So how long are you in China for? Until Friday, so four more days. Four more days. Yes. Going down to Shanghai, Shanghai Hong tomorrow. Kong. Uh, and then going back to also on Saturday, uh, Saturday morning. Okay. And then I'm going to stay uh, in Norway for half a year and then go back to Hong Kong during spring. Okay. Well, fantastic, Ola. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. It's Thank you been very much, Chris. fascinating to hear your story from Hong Kong to Oslo and, and back to China. We wish you the best on your trip here. And thank you to DNB for being on the show. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Chris Reining Show. For more podcasts or information about China, go to chrisreining.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Join us next time for another edition of The Chris Reining Show. The views in this podcast are Chris Reining's own and are not representative of other legal entities. This podcast does not provide investment advice or recommendations to enter in securities transactions. For more information and disclaimers, go to chrisreining.com. 